Daddy, it looks like we can get started. My name is Brian C. Jones. I'm from Cleveland, Ohio. And welcome to the uh, 13th Annual International uh, Conference on Stigma. And this is what we call the Black Work Group, where we talk about everything Black. This is going to be an open and candid discussion about things that affect uh, the Black community as it relates to HIV and AIDS and other systemic and structural disparities that exist and continue to put us at a predisposition for contracting HIV and AIDS, as well as other social and structural disparities. So I will also want to introduce my, my two co-hosts. I want y'all to just step on in and introduce yourself. Um, Alinda, Sheila, uh, come on and tell us about yourself. Ms. Sheila. Okay, Jerry. She why is you connecting step... from Uganda, so she probably oh, okay. she'll probably Maybe. jump in when she can. Okay, well, Jerry, go ahead and jump in. Okay, well, Jerry, has she made it in? Well, Jerry, go ahead and jump in and tell us about yourself. All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to this um, Black HIV work group. My name is Jerry Washington. I live in Baltimore, Maryland. I reside in Virginia, Ray, Carolina, and I currently work for Heart to Hand, Inc. Um, as the CDC Links to Care Navigator. And so uh, Patty, uh, could you just step in quickly and just tell us a little bit, a little bit about Miss Sheila? until we can get her on? Is that possible? Yeah, I don't have Io in front of me, but I know she's in Uganda and she does um, some a lot of good work in Uganda. She, she connected with our group a couple years ago. So I know she's very interested in, um, I know one of her interests is um, to do with research and how to get more young people into, um, like HIV research and mm -hmm. services and things like that. Um, hopefully, she can give us some more details when she comes yeah, on. Yeah, no, but that that's great because we welcome her into the conversation, and we do know that for those who are coming in from uh, international places, it's hard for them to connect sometimes. But we want to keep that that uh, passageway open so that when she does join, we can jump right in and welcome her, and welcome her to the conversation with open arms. Like I said, my name is Brian Jones. I'm a person uh, with an uh, AIDS diagnosis for 39 years. Uh, I'm the founder of the Dirt Advocacy Movement and also the founder of uh, the Sankofa HIV Initiative, which holds healing weekends for people living with HIV. Icon to the lab of can the we meet other people, bar. please? Uh, and also, uh, we do workshops and trainings for not just people living with HIV, but for providers. And it's all conceived and implemented by people living with HIV. So I want to pose a question to the group, and and people just jump right in there. Talk. Let's let's name a stigma that may be unique to the Black community as it relates to HIV. Anybody can jump in. One is going to be for me, and it may not be unique to the white to the black community. Is uh, someone's mother spraying them with Lysol because they contracted HIV? Anybody else jump in there? Let's talk about stigma. Um, I know y'all know huh. about stigma. Okay, Brian, let me get in here. Hi, my name is Jeffrey Haskins. One of the stigmas is. Um, HIV and aging uh, for people who have been living with HIV, long-term survivors, those that are over 50 plus, also including verticals and also including people who have- What do you mean by verticals? Verticals of uh, young people or uh, transmission could be from mother to infant and they have lived with HIV and AIDS all their entire life. Um, and that's verticals, or it can be a younger person through children mm -hmm. pediatrics that acquired HIV in some manner and are living with it. 
I've been living there with 30 years. And so there have been children who have been born and lived with it longer than me. Some of them are 35, some of them are 40. Um, and so we include them in the HIV and aging. And then we, um, the stigma is about um, basically us that are aging with HIV, we're, we're invisible. And I remember at the time at the beginning of the epidemic, when most Black people were invisible, which was another stigma around dealing with HIV. So that's that's what I wanted to offer. Thank you. Anyone else jump in there? I would like to add that um, some people um, are discouraged to marrying people um, who is living with HIV and also um, have been encouraged people that they later find out or they have disclosed their status to to um, consider more of a reason to divorce someone so and we and we had see in the chat those usual things that we see about eating on different utensils mm -hmm. and those kind of things and also uh, thinking that it's a gay disease uh, we know that those things exist we also know that uh a major stigma is that it's God's punishment or God's wrath. Mm -hmm. and, and we see that show up quite a bit in the black church uh, as well as other spaces. But that we also got to understand that that type of stigma is not just unique to the black church. It's, it, it shows up in all faiths and all religious spaces. So uh, with that being said, um, we, we often hear that People living with HIV are most at risk for, for contracting HIV. What are your thoughts about that? What do you think, you know, uh, or they say we're a targeted population. What does that mean? Do we have a bullseye on, the, on our backs for, for contracting HIV? Uh, um, and why do you feel like we are most at risk for contracting HIV? Jump on in there, y'all. Let's see, we have our hand Olga Erwin. I'm sorry. Yeah, I see we have a hand, Olga Erwin. Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, but we can always hear you. Okay. Um, you, you, you said what I was talking about, got to say, was about the church. And it's not only us that uh, get the stigma. Like with me, my family was kicked out of church because of my status, because they were taking care of me. And they got, and so um, it's not only, it's, you know, we get it and our family gets it, but also too with the stigma is also when you go into doctor's offices, their staff, the receptionists, you know, whoever's at the front of the office and the people that are taking our information and stuff, we get our, that's where I receive a lot of stigma to this day from. You know, because their voices change, were, you know, body language all changes. And I still get the question as of today, how did you get it? Okay, let me ask you this. You being a, a cisgender white female, how have you seen stigma show up with your black friends when you may be together or in a space inhabited by you and someone of black or a person of color? How have you seen stigma show up for them in a different way? Um, when I'm with them, and if they want to do, uh, I, I'm practicing it, and it's hard for me because I'm used to always opening my mouth up when I see things wrong, is the first way to see if they're saying something so they have the power themselves. But yet, um, and you know, I've done it a lot with protesting and stuff. I've, I've actually get in the front line because I know there's reasons why others can't get arrested or speak up. Um, so that's have where I use my weightness at. Has it, have you seen it show up differently for Black folks than it yes. does for, for you? And in yes. what ways have you seen that? Um, with white people, it's we um, we could get away with saying more stuff mm -hmm. and being more, you know, vocal 
um, than people of color. Um, we could put our bodies on the line more than people of color. Um, so that's why I try to sit back in some places, which is hard for me. So they have their power, but I still end up always speaking up. Mm -hmm. And sometimes okay. overspoken for it. Well, you're never overspoken for, Olga. You have showed up and been a staunch supporter in this fight. So let's move past this. I see in the chat that people are talking about HIV. It's assumed that if you were using, uh, that you were involved in substance abuse, that you had a promiscuous lifestyle. Um, so let's talk about what we know about people language first. Um, we have some hands, Brian. Okay, go ahead. So first we have uh, Jacob, then Jeffrey, then Sonia, and I don't want to mess up your name, Teriro. So in an order, you can go. Jacob? Um, yes. Um, let me get my camera on. So sorry. Um, so I wanted to go back to the last topic that we were talking about and how you stated that it was more like a, a target that was placed on the black community. And of course we know that there are many different types of people that contract HIV and are living with it. But like you said, it seems as though that there has been a target and disproportionately placed on the Uh, disproportionately placed on those um, within the Black community, but I wanted to go back and say that um, would it be more of the social determinants that come from uh, those within the Black community, or is it more historically policy, as you would say, that has influenced the impact of HIV within the Black community? Well, you know, the, those two go hand in hand for me, and I'll let somebody right. else speak. But the policy and social and structural determinants or social and structural disparities that exist, are part of those social and structural disparities is our legal system, is our policy system. HIV is just a symptom of a larger problem. HIV is not the one man on the island that we have to, to uh, address. We've got to address the other systemic and structural disparities that exist. It should be no surprise that Black people and people of color are most impacted by HIV and AIDS because we're most impacted by everything, housing, education, uh, food, anything you can think of, we're last on the totem pole. Next person. Jeffrey, I think it is. Uh, yeah, I think it's I just wanted to go back to your question. Um, about go ahead, I'm sorry. It, they're probably Long. Jeffrey, Jeffrey, so. Long. Jeffrey Haskins or Jeffrey Long. Jeffrey Long. Right, there you go. Oh, well, um, you'll have to excuse me. My, I'm on, on satellite internet, uh, and so there's a delay. Uh, speaking of social determinants and uh, stigma in the hospital setting, I had a Caucasian nurse, and I'm of uh, the indigenous population, and at, at our hospital, she would have to always put gloves on just to take my blood pressure, just to touch me or anything like that. So yes, we face stigma as well. I mean, stigma is is in everyday life and everyday thing. We really can't make a science out of stigma. So that's where I'm at with all this. Thank you, Jeffrey. Sonia? Hey, everybody. Um, as a cisgender, I guess pansexual, but I choose to just, I just choose to sleep with the men. But every, I, I'm the one that put the statement in there that, oh, you must have been using because, you know, the first two statements I always hear is, oh, you, that must have been when you were using, um, when you were risky, which I hate that word. 
Um, and actually I acquired HIV having a heterosexual relationship and, and the protection I was using broke. So stigma comes in many ways. And of course, I, as a white woman, when I went to my doctors, because I have health insurance and I was able to, and I felt comfortable to, because I never had any issues with the healthcare system, I had that privilege of having my medication available right away, finding out that U equals U right away. I'm in, so the stigma is, it begins right there. Everyone should have that equal access. Everyone should have that, no matter who you are, what you might have in your body, what your skin looks like, everybody should have that. And I, even myself, has felt stigma in the hospital setting when I went for a procedure and like two drops of my blood hit the floor. And these, all of a sudden, like four nurses bombarded in there with all these cleaning supplies, gloves on. And this was in January of 2022. And I instantly made a statement right there in the room about thanks for stigmatizing me. And as soon as my procedure was over, I made, I called and I spoke to the supervisor and I addressed it right away. But again, I'm a white woman. I have that privilege to be able to do that. And I choose to use that to speak for everyone else. And again, I've said this in many forums and Brian, I know you will hold me to this. If I ever step over the line and say something that I should not as a white woman, please check my ass, please do it. That's well, all. Let me ask you this, let me ask you this. As a white cisgender woman, have you ever been associated or accused of being too black? or being around too many black people, or speaking oh up for black people, or oh. being or some of that stigma of black people coming in, coming your way. I grew Give up some in examples a, of that. A hundred percent, Brian. I grew up in a small 3,000, mostly, I'm, I got it, white Trumpers. Anyways, I'll leave that out. Anyways, I grew up in that town. And of course, the, when I first married my second husband, who was a black man, of course, there was all kinds of, um, but don't you, you do realize you're white, like a couple of years ago, you know, and I really started making a stand for my brothers and my sisters that I love and really made a stand. Everybody from my hometown was like, don't you realize you're white? Yeah, I understand I'm white, but I don't care. It, I don't care. But I also have had many, many of you, including you, Brian, that have brought me into the family and accept me. And no matter what I look like on the outside, you know how I truly feel on the inside. Does that answer some of it, Brian? Yeah, that does answer it. So I want to pose a question to, to my black folks out there and y'all sitting there with bated breath. Give me a, a instance when you felt that a white person overstepped the line when it came to HIV and AIDS, when it came to a situation where you say, hold on, Missy, this does not relate to you. My stigma, because I've had people tell me that stigma is stigma. And that's and to me, that's a damn lie. Stigma is not stigma. Stigma shows up in different forms for different people. And it may be some similarity. But me being a Black man, and I'm going to say this and I'm going to let it go. Me being a Black man, I'm a Black man first. Uh, living in America before I'm, I'm a person living with HIV. So I got to deal with trying to survive on a daily basis just being a black man first. Then HIV comes into play. So it was somebody else next to speak, uh, Jerry. Yes, I believe we have Tariro and then Jerome. Hmm. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I'm uh, from Zimbabwe, and I uh, just want to talk about stigma and uh, black people. And me as a black person and uh, married, uh, but who now is I'm this, who is this speaking. Who's speaking? Tariro. Okay. okay, I see it. All right, go ahead. Sorry about that. Mm -hmm. 
So in marriage, it's very difficult uh, as, uh, in, in our culture as black people to disclose. Because when you marry, you marry everyone, you marry the whole clan, you marry even their animals, you marry everyone. So by the time you want to disclose, they will say you are kissing our family, you are using our name and so forth. And it will spill to the church. Because when you marry, you even also change the church to your to your marriage, to your in-laws church. And it will spill even to the church. So stigma is very, very uh, uh, violent in married black people because of our culture. Secondly, uh, disclosure in discorded couples, if it is the woman who is uh, positive, and the, the man is negative, the, 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 it's equal to divorce. You'll be named, you'll be you know, shamed, everything. But if it is vice versa, if it is the man who is a, a positive and you are, a, a woman is negative, it's normalized, it's okay. There's, there's nothing wrong for a, 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 a man to be HIV positive and a woman be negative. But the other way around, there's a lot of stigma. And also, uh, when it, from the healthcare workers and the technocrats and so forth, when pandemic hits my country, the first port of call to be accused of going to die uh, with the COVID-19, it was people living with HIV and AIDS. Everyone was pointing to to us, even at family level, at myself. Yeah. Oh, this is the, the, here comes COVID nineteen. Ah, it's about you people with HIV. We are going to die if you cough, even if you sneeze. It was a big thing, but we thank God for the grace and so forth. During the pandemic, they realized that most of us people with HIV and AIDS. We did not go beyond just having a uh, uh, COVID-19. Uh, now they are doing research about it, as to say, why didn't we die of COVID? Is it, was it because of ARV? To me, again, that is a stigma. So any new pandemic, any new disease, the first person to be attacked is a person living with HIV and AIDS. I thank you, over. Yeah, so I, she brought up a very good point. Because if we look in the United States, we see kind of the reverse situation. She said that women, even if the man, if it's reversed, that the man is, is the person living with HIV, they still stigmatize and blame the woman. Uh, if, if, I'm, if I'm not mistaken, that's what I heard. And whereas in the US, a lot of times uh, the women and this is not all women, and this is not all cases, so y'all don't cut my head off for saying it. But a lot of times we see that women receive the sympathy vote because of some man lied to them or they contracted it from a man, X, Y, Z, X, Y, Z. That is not to say that it's always like that. It's not to say that women are, have pity parties because women in America, and I must say this, and my black women are leading the fight when it comes to HIV and AIDS. I just have to be uh, upfront uh, about, about that, about how women are showing up and showing out, uh, even though we don't see women being represented in clinical trials and other health, health uh, issues and settings. They are showing up and, and helping to lead this fight. Uh, anybody yeah. feel, Jerry, feel free yeah. to jump in and direct this conversation wherever you want it to go. And Brian, I, I just want to pick about what you just said. And that's why I brought up what I brought up earlier. You know, I, I am an example of that, where I was married to my wife. She knew everything about me from, from my sexuality to my HIV status. Went so back, what is your sexuality since you threw it out there in the ring? I am pansexual. So You are what? Pansexual. And what does pansexual mean? Because some people may not know. Pansexual for me means that my attraction um, is not based upon their genitalia. Um, my attraction to someone is based upon their personality, the energy they give off. Um, that's what attracts me to that person. So, okay. so that means it could be a male, it could be a sister to male, 
a cisgender female, it could be a trans man, it could be a trans woman. And it can also be someone who's non-binary as well. So um, when I um, got married, like, again, she knew everything about me. She decided one day to tell her family <laughs> my HIV status. And so it created a, a big emotional deal. Um, they would tell her, well, you should get a divorce. And, you know, and all these types of things. And so I ex experienced stigma in that way. And, I, and, and again, I'm a male, a male, a man that's living with HIV where my wife was HIV negative. And so there are, are, there are many examples out there that exist such as, such as mine. All right, so now we have Jerome and then after Jerome. I, don't, I just wanna hold up because uh, we now have Shalinda. Her device is now compiled. So she's able to come on. So I, as, her, as her being a, a, a co-host, I wanna allow her the chance to come on and represent. Uh, Shalinda, uh, step forward and tell us about uh, your issues. Um, hello everyone, sorry about the noise in the background. Uh, I'm at school, so I'm attending from school and it's a bit late here in Uganda because it's uh, coming to, it's already 7.37 PM, so, People are in the background at school, so I try to join in using the Wi-Fi at school. Uh, but um, I've been an HIV advocate for the past, I think, six, seven, eight years. And um, uh, here in Uganda, I've been living as a young positive, and I've been uh, encouraging my fellow young positives to be able to come out and live positively, and uh, it helps them lift the weight off. I, I wasn't able to listen well how the conversation was going because my device was on and off so but i'm willing to join in whenever possible but i'm happy to meet you all and i'm glad that i could be able to join so is there anything you'd like to share uh directly related to stigma in in your country um it depends because it depends on the communities you go to because in some communities you go and uh people will easily accept who you are. And in some uh, people will really withdraw and they think you've lived a promiscuous life, uh, that that's why you ended up being positive and probably they don't even know your story. Like for me, I was born HIV positive, but the moment I say I am 28 and I have HIV, the only thing, like most communities, especially in the local communities, so think, I've been very promiscuous. I've slept around with many men, and yeah, so that's the. And so, and so, how do they deal with sexuality there? Is it is it illegal to be LGBTQ, or is it frowned upon, or is it accepted in some spaces? Uh, in my country, it's illegal to be in the LGBT community, but there are some organizations trying to fight for the rights of the LGBTQ, but. Nationally, it's illegal to be in that community. Mm -hmm. So, so thank you for that. And as we can, I want everybody to reflect on how fortunate we can be, or how unfortunate we may be, depending on what part of the country or the world that we live in. How we, in some spaces, are afforded privileges that others aren't. Uh, Jerry, can you see someone else who has their hand up? Yes. Um, we have Jerome first, and then we have Bonnie next. Good morning. Can y'all hear me? Yes, sir. Good morning. Okay, okay. Thank you. I had a problem there. I just want to jump on the uh, piggyback on some things that I've heard and uh, explain more uh, of what I heard. <clears throat> I believe when I first began listening, an individual was speaking about age in terms of HIV and AIDS. I am one who is beyond that 80 and 90 terms of what we call long-term non-progressor. And by grace, I'm currently healthy and well, good immune system, good T cells, and in my 35th year. Under healthcare, I have never experienced in my continuum of care any stigma <clears throat> from the provider. I felt stigma from the provider's assistance that they have. 
who will find out and uh, this about me and then will show it in facial expressions and even in some procedures they've had to, done, to do. For example, uh, dental care, where I had to let the lady know, I think you are applying overdue pressure and I believe I know why. Okay, so if you can't stop, then I'll stop it. And the way I stop it is not going to be pleasant. And I make that known. I'm unfortunate to have to speak to someone like that. Um, but I found it to come from there. When it came down to, I heard the person saying, being asked in the medical realm, how did you? That question I've never been asked. I've been asked by those providers, how long have you? And so someone have, asked the question. They, what does a non-term long progressor, I mean, a, uh, a long-term non-progressor mean? Back in, in that day, from the time that I was diagnosed, I was not progressing toward the immune efficient, efic, immune, acquired immune deficiency syndrome. It was just the virus was present. Uh, somewhere like saying like a bear hibernating. So it was there. Then some 20 years later, due to some stress in my life, it caused what I described this, a uh, shooting up of, of the uh, viral load and a down of the uh, T cell. And so it was at that point in time, prior, my position was like, if it's not broke, we don't fix it. But now it's broke and let's get on the road to taking the meds and all. And at first I was not a person receptive. So he did not push me until he felt I was mentally ready as well to go that route. So the stigma, again, as we've been speaking of and we said health field and even in church, you know what those individuals in the faith base are supposedly believing, don't let that deter you from that faith if because of them, they show you stigma. I've been surrounded by love from the faith base. I've worked in harm reduction of this and I've had a great support from the faith base out there with me, men and women, deep night during the outreach and working with particularly commercial and transactional sex workers. I'll pass. Okay, uh, I see somebody has their hand up. If, if you don't want to speak, could you put your hand down? Because I don't know who that is. Okay. So um, I do want to mention, uh, I talked about people language first. And it's important that we as people living with HIV, and I know it's probably those who are living with HIV on this call and those who are not living with HIV. But I always say that Everyone should be HIV positive, not from a blood test, but from a perspective, positive about helping us eradicate this fight, positive about making it safe for people. Okay, Bonnie had her hand up. Go ahead, Bonnie. Thanks, Brian. Um, thanks, everyone. Um, it's good to see um, a, a very positive um, um, conversation that we're having. Um, I feel like there's a lot. there's been a lot of stigma around um, what... Um, what people consider to be um, men or who are on the down low. I think that language in general has a, is very stigmatizing. Um, and I'm one, and I think it's led to a lot of misinformation um, in the black community. And I don't know if we've ever really gotten around um, the stigma from that. And if we, if we're having these conversations about what that actually means um, to us today. And, and that's a great point. And I think a lot of times, a lot of the, when we look at the epidemiology and the reflectiveness of the epidemic and conversations that are being had at these tables, a lot of credence is being put to this download thing. The download thing is not something that's new. It's not something that just happened. Uh, in my opinion, and, and I have to give my opinion and, and don't cut my head off for this. I think a lot of times, uh, those who are in relationships with men who may have sex with other men, sometimes people see what they want to see and see what they don't want to see. Uh, but that's not for every situation. 
sometimes people are very deceptive and good at being deceptive, but we've got to understand that when it comes to, and that's a unique stigma for the black community, for the black man who may be same gender loving or exploring or just exploring what I call life, there is no space that they can call their own because the, the community will disown them. The black church will disown them. So there's no way for, so many of them act as if and, be, and become a part of uh, heterosexual relationships when they haven't had a chance to explore their sexuality. So I understand that. And I know we have a whole lot of different opinions about that. And it's not a cookie cutter conversation about this that we can have because, but I think we put a lot of credence into a man coming home from prison, uh, uh, transmitting HIV to women. Men don't just go to prison and become uh, sexually active with other men. They were doing it before they went to prison. So if you were in a relationship with a man and they came out of prison, they didn't just come out of prison and started having sex with men. They were more than likely doing it prior to going to prison. And that's from somebody who's been incarcerated. Go ahead. Bonnie, go ahead. Somebody else want to talk? Well, I'll say, Brian, I've heard that same statement as well. But I would say it's a 50-50. I was a 50-50. The fact that you say man went in there and then it was like a smorgasbord. Now, there were men who came in there and also had needs, and they had those needs to be filled by those who were available to fill those needs as well with them. Okay, so I was gonna talk about prior to this, I was gonna talk about, there's a couple of things I wanna talk about is uh, two things. One is uh, people first language, because a lot of times we stigmatize ourselves and people first language is very valuable, not just for people living with HIV, for those people who are also doing this work. We're not HIV positive, we're people living with HIV. We don't have a disease, we contracted a virus, we weren't infected, we uh, tra uh, contracted HIV. We, disclosure is also a stigmatizing word because disclosure means secret or new, new or secret information. And your status should not be a secret, it should be yours to share. So as we talk about that, um, I wanted to talk about that. It was something else I wanted to talk about, um, mention, and I can't think of what it is. So somebody jump in there and save me. <laughs> oh, I know what it was. Uh, when we talk about long-term survivors or long-term thrivers, there's several ways to, to, to classify that. Uh, long-term survivors can be, we, um, we normally hear that long-term survivors or thrivers are people who contracted HIV before ARVs, which is antiretroviral therapy medication. But you also have to realize that a person does not have to have an HIV diagnosis to be considered a long-term survivor or thriver. Now, some people may discount that, some people may fight that to the end, but we have a lot of people who were on the battlefield who, who saw the carnage who were in, in the midst of it, who took care of their dying lovers, friends, loved ones, and they have survived as well as we have. And they have post-traumatic stress syndrome. And I also wanna throw out there, how many people are familiar with the organization Kick-Ass? If any, somebody is, somebody jump in and tell what Kick-Ass is about. I heard somebody. Nobody knows what kick ass is about? Yeah, I, I, I know what kick I know Go what ahead. kick ass is about. Kick ass is about the uh kick that was an advocacy group. They're still an advocacy group and they're out of California and they're doing work about us being at the table because there will be no solution without us. Um and Jax um started that and uh that's what I know about it. Some other people may know some more about it. Well, kick ass, the ass stands for AIDS survival syndrome. Right. And, 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 and the fact that it's called kick ass because us long-term survivors and thrivers are kicking HIV and AIDS in the ass. 
because a lot of people didn't expect us to be here. And as this, as the, the organization started to develop, they realized that many people discounted us. So they finally got scientific data to support the AIDS survival syndrome, that we have post-traumatic stress syndrome, that we have, that we can't live. Many of us have, have a hard time living past the, 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 the present day because we live so long with thinking we were gonna die each day. Uh, that there are many things that are unique to those long-term survivors and thrivers. And we now have scientific data to support that. So I just wanted to throw that out there. Anybody, anyone else have anything else they want to add to this conversation? But this is the Black similar, HIV work group. Similar to um, Kick-Ass back in the day, I was part of what was called ACT UP. And we did, the, we were taught uh, so what, trained. You know what ACT UP stands for? What does that mean? You know what that means? The ACT UP, I can't give you the, the acronyms exactly okay, now, but I can ACT tell you the behavior. ACT UP stands for uh, AIDS Coalition to Unleash Power. Our goal was to be there at the table for decisions that were being made by about us, uh, to be there and be a part of those decisions. And if need be, act up to make certain we got what it was that we felt we needed. There were a number of times when I was asked to step down off the table there and entertain my comments because that's the way we went. If we got in the boardroom, we showed out so that they would hear us and drown them out to make certain that those things were being met by those who needed them, who knew more so about it than the ones who claimed they were providing it or providing the funds and et cetera. And let's go back to then those Ryan White dollars. So uh, I also wanna say, if you look at the history of ACT UP, you would think that black people were nowhere to be found because most of the pictures and, 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 and the historical things that you see consist of white gay men and white lesbians. But black people were on, um, I always tell people you gotta do a Sankofa moment and I'm gonna give you a little tidbit of history. If we look back to 1981, when they first talked about those 44 white gay men, we knew they were white gay men who had contracted this strange gay cancer when the news first hit in the New York Times in 1981, they failed to mention that during that same calendar year that 86 black people had contracted that same gay cancer. So the, our narrative as black people has always been askew. Our narrative has never been true when it comes to HIV and AIDS. They didn't start reporting black folks numbers until 1983. And even then, they only reported people who had progressed to what we now know as AIDS, not people who had the antibodies showing up. So by the time they started to do that, when the floodgates opened, it was too late. They also, we had a slogan of with black women that said, women don't contract HIV, uh, women don't get AIDS, they just die from it. And that was said because many women succumb to opportunistic infections because the CDC failed to mention cancers, uh, opportunistic infections that were unique to women and especially black women because of lack of care such as cervical cancer. Many women succumbed to these opportunistic infections because they couldn't get proper health care. Um, so it's things like That's that true. that we need to know. Also, we've got to understand that by 83, heterosexual couples had already started to to sell to, to HIV diagnosis. Also, by 85, those who inject drugs had also surpassed those uh, men who have sex with men or gay men. At one point in 1988, women surpassed the number of diagnoses of men. So I just wanted to throw that little history lesson out there for y'all. So somebody else jump in there. Okay, I just want to say I just uh, got out of a trans leadership school and we were talking about ACT UP and we listened to a podcast about ACT UP. And like you were saying earlier about the different terminologies, I learned the terminology about grit and how they talked about grit before people started calling it HIV and different stuff. Grit like that. stand, what does grit stand for? 
Oh God, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, because I got it wrote down. Give me a second. Give me gay a second. related immunodeficiency. Gay related immunodeficiency. Grid. And they they talked about grid and just how like uh they challenged the FDA and different things and how they were on the like they did their own newspaper and different stuff and like now in this day and age people need to do more of that also speaking on the situation as far as like when it comes down to feeling like we're a target to me I feel like we're a target when we out each other as far as our status and that's what makes us a target because the other side of the spectrum the other subpopulations you don't often see them bashing it when it comes down to HIV but you see our own community trying to bash each other about it so that's how we continue to be the target when it comes down to it and then not speaking up and making it where it's not as if we're going against each other we're coming together it, we need more unity when it comes down to it. We need more people that are living with it that's not afraid to come out, especially with the younger generation. You have these things to where like they seek validation for the community and they need to just seek validation within themselves in order to live in their truth. And then that way they'll have other people jumping on the bandwagon or whatever to try to end the epidemic. It's going to be very hard to end it. And also we have to put STDs back on the forefront too. Like she was the mother of all this. You have to think about it. They don't never talk about STDs. They always focus on HIV. But what about people that have HIV that still contract STDs or people that contract STDs that trickle into having HIV? So it's just a conversation where all those need to be put back into one nugget mm-hmm. in order to. And you never hear about, remember, remember herpes was the big thing. And I, 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 I'm actually, I'm actually doing something now strictly for that or whatever, because I know several people that, that deal with that and they don't know, they don't have any, they don't have a support system and it's not really an outlet here. You have one central location where you will go and get that test. And I promise you within the end of the week, somebody know your business. And it's a sad situation where you have to really hire these people with a fine tooth comb to know, are you here for an impression, a check, or are you here for an impact? So it's just one of those things to think about even working in service work. So check out the chat. Somebody put a great uh, tidbit of information about a great book in the chat. And I think Jeff Haskins is up next. Uh, let me just talk, um, Brian, thank you for, um, and all of y'all talking about ACT UP. I just wanted you to know that in 1983, uh, Gay Men of African Descent, uh, which is a Black agency in New York, we were in the room. Um, they didn't want to include our pictures in there. We didn't take our own pictures, so we missed that opportunity. But I just want you, to, I agree with you, we were there. We were in those demonstrations. We were at City Hall. We were in those demonstrations with President Bush, President Reagan when they came. And ACT UP is still um, going strong in Philadelphia. Uh, Jose Marcos is running ACT UP in in, um, Philadelphia and ACT UP in New York is still running strong. and And a brother man named Keith is running ACT UP New York. And when we come together, we definitely come together when we do AIDS Watch. We definitely come together wherever there's advocacy around HIV and AIDS around the country. And there's also a um, group every, um, it meets once a week. So uh, we're still doing the work. And I just wanted you, we're not dead. It's still act up, fight fight AIDS. So someone has a hand raised. Whoever has that hand raised, jump on in there. No. Uh, If you have a hand raised, go ahead, Jerry. Yeah, the only hand raised I see um, was Jeffrey, but he just spoke. Oh, he just put it down. Okay, so uh, like uh, I said, uh, what time is it? What time yeah. is it over? We got ten minutes left, so let's uh, let's come with some solutions about the black community. Uh, one thing I think is time for black folks to be 
for black folks to take care of black folks. It's time for many of those uh, ASOs who have white leadership to step down and allow black folks to take care of black folks. It's time for these ASOs to have people who look like us, live like us, talk like us. Because if you keep talking about the epidemiology and the reflectiveness of the epidemic, we've got to start using their language against them. If you're saying that the, the epidemiology, which is the numbers that are showing, are reflecting of young black, same gender loving men. First of all, we need to stop calling them men who have sex with men. Because what you're doing is reducing everything that these young men do to just sex. I don't care if you have sex with somebody different every day. It doesn't discount the fact that you may be searching for love, first of all. And so we've got to change what that looks like. And, and it's time for white leadership to step aside and black folks to be put in these positions and allow us to handle the money. We've got to start utilizing a racial equity lens when bringing community-based organizations to the table and, and, and adding value to those smaller organizations when we bring them to the table because they have the trust of the community. Somebody else jump in there. And also- What, what I found back- I also believe- Yes, I'm sorry, Jerry. The education about, you know, Black business owners who have ASOs or nonprofit organizations that provide services to our community, we need to provide- Can somebody mute their, uh, mute their device, please? Go ahead. We need to provide education and awareness and the infrastructure that comes with that. Because from North Carolina, we have many, many Black-owned nonprofit ASO organizations but their doors got closed because they mismanaged money. Yes. So it's not yes. that opportunity has not been given to us. And I'm going yes. to speak to the states I've been in, but we also yes. have to, as black people, hold other black people accountable when they are in these positions of power and leadership to not do yes. our community disjustice. So, so, so in many ways, I hear what you're saying, but for me, I have to look at the community that was involved because we know shape, skin don't make us kin, first of all. Just because a black person look black, talk, they, they don't necessarily mean they speak it from a black perspective. And we know when shady stuff is happening. So I think that the community could have acted a lot quicker. Uh, I, and I'm not judging one way or another because I was not there. But a lot of times, like you say, we've got to hold community accountable. And that starts with holding our health departments accountable because we can't just point at these black organizations and say they mismanaged money. When mismanagement started from the top, it started with the government. It started with our health department. So we've got to start holding the people who trickled those little money, them little funds that them organizations uh, mismanaged was a drop in the bucket to what the larger entities, such as our health department, how they mismanage money. So we've got to start holding these health departments accountable, first and foremost. That's all I got to say. <laughs> but it is, it is true to the fact of what Jerry said, that infrastructure, and that's what I've seen when I started my work 20 plus something years ago, was our Black organizations did not I not only have the infrastructures for receiving those dollars, they did not even have cash flow. Fast forward, in my city, now there's a church who has gotten a hold of some of them dollars to make certain that in their community, because they took a survey in their community and found out X number of people were identified as individuals living with HIV AIDS, as well as involved in harm. And so they sought those dollars and brought those dollars into their church, but not into their church coffer, okay? They had it separated. And so now this is a site that also does in Ohio, what we tried to get done here in Dayton some 20 years ago, uh, needle exchange. I did not know you were from Dayton. 
uh, as a side, yes, I'm, having a, I'm having a men's uh, uh, a men's uh, a healing weekend coming up December second. Uh, get my contact from Patty or somebody because uh, I I definitely love for you to show up. Well, get it from William. Well, thank Booth. you. You got a William Booth's contact? I I know William Booth. I, that name comes. Do you, have a pen? Do you have a pen handy right now? I keep one. Okay, 216-640-3404. And everybody wondering why am I getting my, my phone number? You can find it on any public restroom wall across America. So it's no Hello. <laughs> That's Brian Jones. <laughs> uh, so, so, so Brian, Brian is down. We wind it down to the session. And so Brian, Sheila got something to say, which is one. Go ahead, us. Sheila. Yeah, um, I had the conversation. It was really interesting. So I would wind up saying that you all sum up by saying nothing for us without us. So mm -hmm. every time uh, a stakeholder is going to implement a program or anything, they should always involve. The beneficiary so it is nothing for us without us so it's if it's not for us and they didn't put us in and you know i always say and this is not to discount it because i think that women started that slogan as black folks in america we got to be aware of programs that claim to be about us for us but really don't represent us so we've got to constantly be aware because there are a lot of asos getting money Craig programs that claim to be about us, for us, with us, but don't really include us, don't think about us, and don't want to pay us. So <laughs> that, that's my thing. Uh, so we're winding down. I appreciate everybody for joining in this conversation. I think it would be great if y'all could help join the Black Work Group so we can help to develop themes and conversations uh, that we can move forward towards next year to make this a bigger platform and a better platform. Uh, I want to thank uh, the uh, Stigma International Stigma Conference and Patricia Houston and, and Dr. Uh, Dr. Rana uh, for allowing us this space and this platform to exist. Um, with that being said, I think we're out. Uh, to my other two co-hosts, if you have any last words, Jerry and Shalinda, feel free to give one last statement in closing. Thank you, Brian. Yes, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us and being a part of this conversation today. And to the International Conference on Stigma, thank you for inviting me to be a part of this conversation as well. And again, please join us. We are looking for others to join this Black HIV work group. Um, we are all different and we come from different backgrounds. and. The, the greater outcome of this is when all of us come together. So please join. Me. Thank you. See, Jerry, you can breathe now, right? <laughs> yes, yes. I would also uh, like to thank Brian and Jerry and Patricia. All of you guys made sure this work group had a session during the conference. It was really hard putting it together, but at least I'm so glad that we were able to have it and it was a lively discussion. Thank you very much, all of you who had to put this. And yes, we together. accept all nationalities into this group. Just because it's called a Black Work Group don't mean that we welcome your perspective and your understanding and your comments into this group. All nationalities and ethnicities are welcome. With that being said, uh, I was your lead voice in this conversation. My name is Brian Jones. Don't forget to fill out the, the the review or the survey. Um, and thank you all. Bye bye. Okay, yeah. A after this, we're just going into lunch and we're going to play some videos. So I'm not sure if he's playing them out of this Zoom or if you have to cancel out and go into the other Zoom, <laughs> but it's one or the other. So look, look out for our lunch videos. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. <laughs>